guys, what's up? It's your girl Paige and today we're going to be talking about what actually is autism. If you're curious about what autism actually is, stay tuned. <laughs> being here. If you guys don't know me, my name is Paige Layal. You can follow me on TikTok and Instagram with the same name. Make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube as I'll be posting more videos more frequently, I promise you. Something on my phone. What the frig is that? Something goopy on my phone. Sorry. Because I don't think I've actually made a video regarding what actually is autism. Usually in my videos, I do a lot about different traits of autistics are, or stuff like that. But I don't think I've actually gotten to the root of what is autism. So I thought we'd give that a go today. First off, autism is a developmental disorder. It's not a mental disorder. It's a developmental disorder. So that means that our brains developed actually physically differently than a normal neurotypical person's brain. This is evident in brain scans. If you really want to look, if you give people different stimuli, for the most part, no one's really going to do that to see if you have autism or not. It's just something that's kind of cool that they do studies on. For the most part, what they're going to do is a psychological kind of assessment to try to figure out if that is what you have. And so with the knowledge that they know about autism, there is a certain criteria that you have to meet in order to receive an autism diagnosis. For myself, if you guys have heard about my autism diagnosis journey, I went into this process not knowing that I was autistic, not thinking that I was autistic. I actually went in just to talk to somebody and see if he could figure out what was wrong with me. I figured it would be like anxiety, depression, OCD, and buddy goes, no, you're autistic. And I'm like, I don't even know what that means, sir. I'm 15 and I've never seen autism before ever in my life. I'll, I'll give you guys more of my diagnosis story in another video. What we're going to do today is look at the DSM-5 for a lot of what we talk about in this video. The DSM-5 is a diagnostic manual that is used right now. It's the newest edition that is used to, to diagnose mental disorders and some developmental and intellectual disorders are also within this manual. The DSM-5 is the newest edition and it is what we use currently right now in Canada. Also in the DSM-5, autism is not split into Asperger's, autism, uh, PDD-NOS, it is all just referred to as autism spectrum disorder. So that is what I was diagnosed with. Now let's dive in. Oh, sorry if the camera angle just changed. I just found out that my iPad was actually propping up the camera. That's going to make me uncomfortable. Sorry for the camera change. I don't know what to do. I already filmed too much, so I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to flip my hair out of the way and hopefully stop freaking touching it. I can't stop touching it. Okay, I want to dive into the DSM-5 and we'll start talking about what that actually is. And I'll break them down for you and maybe put them into more, you know, regular human terms rather than doctor fancy terms. There are a few different criteria you need in order to achieve an autism diagnosis. So here's the first one. If you guys see me reading on a screen, it's because I am. We have the first thing, which is Deficits in social emotional re reciprocity, ranging, for example, from abnormal social approach and failure of normal back and forth conversation to reduced sharing of interests, emotions, or affect to failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. Basically, deficits in social interaction, which the main components of social interaction are talking back and forth, uh, having like similar interests or being able to share interests or having a wide amount of interests or finding ways to connect with the person. So if there are deficits in this, that is definitely a sign of autism. I know myself, I definitely have a small range of interests and my interests are very important to me. They might be special interests. I am very obsessed with a small number of things and that is what I like. I also do not understand the point of small talk in a conversation. I don't care. I don't need it. It's exhausting to me. Now, one of the reasons why this is a huge thing for autistics is because our brains develop differently like I was talking about before. Brains have long-term under-connectivity and short-term over-connectivity. When you're born, your brain is filled with more neurons than it actually needs. And over time, as you learn and grow, neurons start to prune away to make the other neurons and those other connections so much stronger. And autistics have actually more neurons, so less neuron pruning. Some people might think, oh my god, that's amazing, you have so many neurons. It kind of makes the connectivity not as good. There are different segments in your brain that are more responsible for certain things than other segments. Usually you guys might have heard that, are you more left-brained or right-brained. There is a little bit of truth to that. That's definitely a thing that happens. Now, what I was talking about before, that long-range under-connectivity means that going from brain part to brain part 
is very difficult. The messages get lost along the way. When something involves only one brain part, we have so many neurons in that one part, we have short range over connectivity. So we really excel at things that only require one brain part. What do you think? Do you think social interaction requires more than one brain part or just one brain part? Social interaction requires multiple parts of your brain working together. That requires parts that recognize faces, recognize tone of voice, recognize sharing responses with other people, conversation. That's multiple parts of your brain working all together. So that's one of the reasons why we do not excel at social interaction. But have you ever met somebody that is like really, really good at just math or really, really, really good at just art? That only requires one area of the brain. That's often why we're stereotyped as those math geniuses. That's because sometimes we are. I know myself, I really excelled at math my whole life. I think math is super easy, comes really easy to me. It has rules, it makes sense, it's organized, and only one part of my brain needs to do stuff. And I got a lot going on in that one part of my brain, so. That is the first point. Now, these next points also go with social interaction. This is deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction, ranging, for example, from poorly integrated verbal and nonverbal communication to abnormalities in eye contact and body language, or deficits in understanding and use of gestures, to a total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication. So this is just deficits in social communication, more so to do with your physicality, what your eye contact looks like, what your hands are doing, what your body posture is doing. We have a hard time seeing what other people People are feeling because that requires more parts of the brain and I don't have that connectivity kind of thing. You can't really see what's normal and what's not normal so and also a lot of those things just don't make sense to us. I don't understand how neurotypicals can just do that. You guys can just look at a face and you know how it's feeling. That's too many brain parts. <laughs> I'm putting it on a t-shirt. That's too many brain parts. When it talks about abnormalities a lot of it you see it's not just saying absolutely no eye contact. It also means hyper eye contact. It's a spectrum. I know myself, I talk excessively with my hands. I give excessive amounts of eye contact to the point where I don't blink and where I'm also not listening or paying any attention. I think when I was younger, I was taught that this is what you have to do. So this is what I'm going to freaking do. But no, I cannot read your facial expression or your body language. That doesn't make any sense to me. You can just tell me with your words, how you're feeling like an adult. And this next thing is deficits in developing, maintaining and understanding relationships. This one just read me for filth. <laughs> Ranging, for example, from difficulties adjusting behavior to suit various social contexts, <sighs> to difficulties in sharing imaginative play or making friends, to absence of interest in peers. So this one just read me out loud. I was not, and I still am not, I'm not interested in people. I don't care to make friends. Like I'm thinking now, I have enough friends. I have like three friends and that's fine. That is, that is enough for me. That is more than enough because I don't want to put in the effort to talk to you and hang out with you. If you're my friend and you're watching, sorry for all this. I don't know why my one nostril is, I have a deviated septum if you can't tell. Look at it. It's because I broke my nose when I was three. Since I was a kid, I've had very limited to no interest in making friends. I think I'm so cool on my own. I don't want to make any more friends. I don't have enough time for all these friends. Friends have rules. Friends have standards. I don't have time for this. I need like two or three good people by my side so I'm not lonely. But besides that, I don't really care. And when it's talking about adjusting behavior to suit various social contacts, that makes no sense to me. Do you guys do that? You change how you feel or how, how you are depending on like the context. Is there context? Do social gatherings have context? Are some social gatherings different than other social gatherings? So I can't even explain that one because as someone who's autistic, I can't, I can't explain it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And then the one in the middle that was difficulties in sharing imaginative play. My imagination is how it is. I have a wild imagination. And as a kid, I was not okay with sharing my imagination with other people. I didn't like them taking my ideas. And I always thought my ideas were better. Not necessarily are they better. Better is an abstract kind of kind of ideology, but in my mind they were better because I came up with them. Obviously I'm gonna like them better than someone else's idea. I've never really liked something that someone else did over my own thing. I think that's just because even if I do it poorly, I know that my idea was 
better for me than someone else's idea. Now we'll go on to some more specifics. This one's fun. Restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities as manifested by at least two of the following. You ready for the following of repetitive behaviors and activities? Stereotyped or repetitive motor movements, use of objects, or speech. Simple motor stereotypies, lining up toys or flipping objects, echolalia, and idiosyncratic phrases. That's me. I have echolalia to a T. I used to memorize movie scripts when I was a kid and recite them and that was my way of conversation was reciting a full movie. If you want to know Barbie and the Magic of Pegasus, I'll tell it to you. It was my first one. Lining up toys or flipping objects, that is me. I loved, instead of playing with my toys like in my imaginative way, like how kids usually play with toys, lining them up or sorting them by color or sorting them by anything, sorting them, putting them, putting a big long, oh, that's fun. Knocking over boxes. Boxes were the shit. I had so many carver boxes just to play with for no reason, just to have. I also would make like houses out of paper because I thought that was so cool. That was my idea of play. My parents hated it because they're like, throw out garbage. And I'm like, no, I cannot. Next thing, insistence on sameness. Okay, stop me right there. Yes, 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 yes. Routines are a must. And anytime a routine would change, I would freak out. I don't know how to do anything new. I already came up with a set of rules in my head and that is what we're going to follow, okay? Flexible adherence to routines, yep. Ritualize patterns or verbal, nonverbal behavior. Verbal, nonverbal behavior. Okay. Extreme distress at small changes. Difficulties with transitions. Rigid thinking patterns. Mm. Breeding rituals. <laughs> Need to take the same route or eat the same food every day. I ate a bologna sandwich every day from kindergarten to grade 12. That's 14 years. So I think that makes some sense. Highly restricted, fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. Yeah, I've always had an intense interest in anatomy. And as a young kid, obviously that scares people because uh, usually kids that are interested in anatomy uh, turn out to be murderers and serial killers which is actually kind of funny because something that I learned, autistics that have specialized interests that have to do with some part of humanity, it is very normal because it's our way of conceptualizing and understanding humanity and our place in it. So a lot of autistics have a special interest in history, things that happen in history, certain eras of history, or biology, certain parts of the world and the world that we live in. When you think about it, I kind of see how I guess everyone has some kind of interest in something like that. Anyway, I still am obsessed with anatomy. I have probably hundreds of anatomy books by now. I have from ranging to coloring books, to children's books, to actual medical textbooks. I have every kind of thing and I always have been obsessed with anatomy. That's just one of my special interests. So they have changed and some have grown and evolved throughout the years. This has been the number one that's always been constant. So it's really easy for me to bring up. Next is hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input <laughs> or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. Example, apparent indifference to pain or temperature, adverse response to specific sounds or textures, excessive smelling or touching of objects, very fast, very visual fascination with lights or movement. So this is me. I like how they included it was hyper reactivity or hypo reactivity because that's true. There is a spectrum, so it's different. I know myself, I am hypersensitive to light. My eyes, I, I actually was prescribed sunglasses to wear all of the time, including inside, including in the winter from when I was in high school. And I said no, because I didn't want to look like a douchebag. Cause a lot of people say that people who wear sunglasses inside look like a douchebag. And I was already picked on enough in school. I did not want to wear sunglasses inside. I'm also hyposensitive to taste. So that means that I can't detect a lot of taste going on. I go for extreme flavors, extreme textures. I'm always putting hot sauce on everything. I'm always mixing up the most intense things. When I was a kid, I would eat a whole onion. I'll eat a whole thing of garlic, a whole tomato, whatever. I do not want to eat a potato. Potatoes are the devil. I don't like potatoes. They're nothing. Potatoes are nothing. Potatoes are nothing. I don't care. When I was a kid, they had to cut all the tags out of all my clothes. 
I'm also uh, allergic to adhesive, so I can't wear band-aids or things that's sticky on my skin or I get blisters and swell up and get all itchy and gross. I even have a smart band on for my watch. I just changed it to the scrunchie and it's been a few days now that I've had it off, but I had to because then my skin started blistering and now it peeled off. So that's really fun. So, you know, these things sound very much like me. This is a next subcategory. Symptoms must be present in the early developmental period, but may not become fully manifest, but may not become fully manifest is what it says. Okay. Until social demands exceed limited capacities or may be masked by learning strategies later in life. So this is just saying that these things need to be present when you're growing up, like when you're young in your early developmental stage. Also that when you become older, things may change, may become more or less apparent depending on what society has asked of you or from what you can handle from societal pressures. This is why, and I wanna clarify, a lot of my videos went very big because I was talking about autism in girls and I was explaining how autism was not originally studied in girls. And this is true. And people were going, I had no idea it was so different. And I would just like to say that the autism itself is not different, but how society treats girls is different. And that is why girls often show different traits than boys. Because growing up, girls are taught to do one thing and boys are taught to do another. And a lot of the times, if a boy is showing autistic traits, they're fine, do your thing, swagger, do your thing. If a girl or anyone that's AFAB is shown autistic traits, a lot of the times it's seen as rude, it's seen as in play, it's seen as something that needs to change. And so that's why girls are often better at masking, often better at social interactions, and often can hide their autism well. This is the next subcategory going on. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of current function. So this is that these symptoms are actually, they're heavily impacting your life. They're impacting your daily function, basically. These disturbances are not better explained by intellectual disability or global developmental delay. So intellectual disability and autism spectrum disorder frequently co-occur, this is what we call comorbidities, to make comorbid diagnoses of autism spectrum disorder and an intellectual disability, social communication should be below that expected for a general developmental level. So this is the time a lot of people say low functioning. So it's actually most of the time autism and an intellectual disability. Autism is a whole separate thing. Autism is separate from anxiety. Autism is separate from ADHD. They are not the same thing. They are not the same diagnosis. And just because I have, you know, a billion freaking disorders, none of them are autism except for autism. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. That's what the DSM-5 says is uh, diagnostic criteria for autism. I hope that you got a little rundown and also some life experiences from myself. Hopefully, maybe that made some things a little clear. You can understand that a little bit better. I will be making more videos like this in the future so you can see more about what autism is in the life, you can see what autism may represent itself like in girls. Also talk about more about symptoms of autism, um, signs of autism. I don't really like saying symptoms, it makes me feel like I have a cold. Hope this helped you guys out. I hope you learn more about yourself, more about your child perhaps. And I hope to see you all very soon. Make sure that you hit the subscribe button and follow me on TikTok and Instagram for more and keep up to date on whether or not I will be releasing other things like a Patreon, maybe a podcast, maybe. I might be doing tons of stuff. I'm in lockdown, so I have lots of time. Hope you guys had a great new year. Happy holidays. And I'll see you very soon. Mwah.